Okay, it's seven o'clock and this is the uh, Deerfield Conservation Commission meeting for May 7th, 2020. And members present, Lewis Mission. Tim Ilchey. Ben Byrne. Pete Law. Okay. And uh, let's see, we have some uh, old business here and that would be a for RDA that was continued from the last meeting. And that is for the Deerfield Country LLC for a driveway installation on Greenfield Road, roughly across from Yankee Candle store entrance. And we did a uh, site visit the uh, April 29th and present was uh, Tim and Pete and myself and Dan Nietzsche and uh, let's see, Matt. Plotkin. Uh, Plotkin. Plotkin, yeah. So, uh, well, the kind of the question was the location of the uh, driveway. And, Louis, do you have uh, to open the meeting? What's that? Do you have to open the meeting? Do you take a no? Oh, I never have. It's oh, always okay. just as long as we have enough members. Our you quorum. Just okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. No. Uh, let's see. So the, the question was the location of the driveway <laughs> and the wetland markings. And so we went out and did a review and uh, the site visit there. And uh, I feel comfortable where the driveway is going. It's outside the uh, buffer zone. And uh, any other uh, comments there from the other members there that were out there? Or, uh, uh, Tim? Yeah, I think we decided that um, although we didn't feel comfortable making a determination about the actual RDA that the location was sufficiently far from what was purported to be the border that we would probably be okay with um, approving that without necessarily approving an RDA. Is that your recollection, Louis? Yes, uh, we did get a, uh, we weren't accepting per se the wetland boundary markings as you know we're, we're not qualified well i'm not qualified for uh you know that but they are reasonable and we've done work with uh gza and with the uh, markings like that and uh we're outside i feel the buffer zone and and uh they did send an amended uh, RDA to take off the marking request. And, uh, and I talked to Mark Stinson and he says that even if it was, we still could sign off on a negative just for the driveway and not rule on the wetlands. So Louis, that was gonna be my question. So on the RDA, so uh they were supposed to, they apparently did submit a new one so in section b they took off the uh b dot b request whether the boundaries uh depicted on the plans or reference below are, are accurately delineated so is that what they took off and they just left whether the work depicted on the plan is subject to the plan to the act yes they they on, <laughs> under b they uh Cross, they uh, checked off B1C, which is whether the work depicted on the plans reference below is subject to the wetland protection. Yep, I think that's what we talked about when you're out there. So that makes sense to me. Yep. The only uh, thing I got a question for Dan. Yep. Nietzsche. Uh, yes, sir. Now we have the amended RDA dated April 30th. You know, we got it through uh, through electronic copy. 
Yeah. Now, did did that get signed and sent to the office, the original? There, um, Louis, this is Mark Reed, Her Her Heritage yeah. Surveys. So, yeah. So that the only change to that RDA application out of the four pages was sheet one to eliminate item B out of B1B. So there is no um, changes in the rest of the application form. So I felt that you could just replace sheet one or page one of it, which I put on amended RDA in the date of April 30th, 2020. Um, okay. Because of the because of the COVID, you know, 19 and not being able to get it signed and submitted to you because <clears throat> the town hall is closed. Okay. No, I just, uh, I'm not sure on the official ruling, but uh, with the amended, if it needs to be dated also by the signatures, I don't know, is Dan Nietzsche there? Does he have a comment? I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, amendment is probably not exactly the right phrase because an amendment is an official process to, to, to change something that's already been approved. You guys haven't approved anything under the RDA. So changing the first page that Mark gave to you is a simple uh, 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 swap, basically, of that first page, and the rest of the document stands as a complete document with a signature, and that's what you're acting on tonight. That so so there's no the amendment is is just this sort of it was amended from the first version but it's really not a technical amendment to the wetlands it's just sort of a revision is is probably a, a a better way to say it it's more of a revision to the okay. original application and that's what you're acting on tonight so there's no no um, impropriety or no break in in um, sort of uh, authority of allowing this to move forward. Okay. Uh, any other members have any uh, comments? Nope. <clears throat> no. Not so, at this time, Louis. Okay. Did you were you did you uh, log on to hear most of it, Bill? I logged on at seven. Um, oh, okay. So from that point on. I'm, I think I'm understanding most of, of what maybe, for the minutes perspective, can I have just a summary? Because uh, as I was logging on, there were there was conversation happening. So, yeah, no, we uh, did the site visit. Yep. Tim and Tim and Pete and myself there on the 429, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> you know went over the. Uh, boundaries, wetland boundaries, and the location of the driveway. And I think you probably heard, you heard it from there. Yes, okay. So with the, with the revision of the application, we're essentially only, only being asked to, to allow them to apply for a highway permit, and we're not ruling on an RDA, because they're not asking us to, right? Not, not well, exactly, this is Dan. Not not exactly true. Uh, you are acting on the RDA, which is the application name. The request, the R part of the RDA, is is the driveway outside of jurisdiction or within jurisdiction. And your opinion, based on the field walk, is it's outside of jurisdiction. So that it, you are you are giving us a determination of applicability on the request for a determination of applicability. So that's the process. You are acting on the RDA, but you're not act you're not acting on the wetland request from the original. You're only acting on the request is the driveway outside of jurisdiction. And can you okay. can you refresh us about Mark Stenson's opinion about this, Louis? <clears throat> uh, he was uh, he he said that we can rule on just Originally, the question was because they had two checks on the RDA about the wetland itself 
and then the work that's going to be done. And we could just uh, approve and sign off on the RDA on just the work. That and you had you you know I think few few of us had kind of questions on the uh, you know wetland uh, markings whether we would accept them or not. And uh, so he said we could just do the work and and that's pretty much what the revised or amended uh, RDA is requesting whether the work, you know, is going to be outside the buffer zone. And it is according to what we, we saw out there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we would be doing so we normally what we do is even though the works outside and there's no jurisdiction, we still will sign off on a negative either a number one or a number four, which is uh, the number one is the area described in the request is not an area subject to protection under the act for the buffer zone. But, but yeah. I, would, I would think we'd go in number four. It's the work described in the request, which is the driveway, and that's all we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I would say a negative number four which says the work right there that they submitted for the driveway is outside the buffer, so we don't have no jurisdiction unless they move unless they move it and change it and the work moves into the buffer, then they have to file a notice of intent. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, I haven't actually seen the revised page one. So what did they, they, did they take off the request for us to rule on the delineation itself? Yes. Okay. So all there is is just the one check mark, whether the work depicted on the plans re reference below is subject to the wetlands, which is outside the buffer zone. So it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it would be a negative number four. And it's just that driveway. That that's the whole thing. And Mark said it's it's not the whole land or anything like that. It's just the driveway. So I I feel comfortable with a negative number four. So is there any other discussion? Because I'll make a motion if there isn't. No, I anybody else? Any comments there or May I have just one more um, description, please? I, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Dan uh, that explained the RDA part of it that we are at this point ruling on the R part. Could could you say that one more time, please? Sure. What I, what I was responding to is is the comment that we're not ruling on the we're not being asked the, the commission is not being asked to rule on the RDA. That's that's not accurate. I'm trying to clarify. <clears throat> Okay. The permit, we, the permit we have filed is called the Request for Determination of yeah. Applicability. Uh -huh. And our request at this, for the commission's purpose at this meeting, is is the driveway outside of wetland jurisdiction? Okay. And so I think I think I've heard Louie and I've heard some of the other members. They're comfortable that, although they may not be comfortable professionally understanding where the wetland boundary might be they're comfortable enough that the driveway is far enough to be outside a hundred feet from sort of a reasonable position. Okay. All and right. because of that, we originally asked for two answers from the commission. We're now down to just one answer or one request is the driveway outside of jurisdiction. And that's all we're asking. And thank so, you for uh, that, for that clarification. Sure. Yeah. So future work will need more review Nothing, you know, nothing that will happen on that property in the future is being sort of allowed by this driveway. It's just the driveway. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So other than that, I'm ready for a motion to answer the question. Okay. I make a motion to approve a negative four on four. the question of is the driveway outside the wetlands boundary? 
Yeah, it's 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 not it's an area subject. It's not an area subject to protection under the act, including the buffer zone. That's, okay. That's, well, that's I'll make that's that motion. <laughs> Anybody? I second it. Okay. Ben Burnham, I'll, that's Louis. Yep. All in favor? Say Tim, your name, please. Tim Hill. Bill, Bill Marapisi. Ben Byrne, aye. Aye. Louis, Louis Pete Mission, Law, aye. aye. What was that, Peter? Yeah, Pete Law, aye. Okay. So uh, we uh, will accept, and I'll check off or just make note. It's a number four, and then negative number four. And uh, We'll figure out how we uh, sign off on this. I think we can do electronic, but we're going to have the office make up the forms. So we'll we'll get back to you in a couple of days on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me. Can I ask a question? Yes. Who's this? What? This is William Mono from Kelleher Drive. What driveway is are you talking about? Probably mine. This is a proposed driveway. It doesn't exist right now. It's oh, all, of, uh, all right. This yeah. isn't Kelleher Drive. This is this isn't the uh, culvert yet. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Hi, I. This is Jen Gannett. I, the assistant town administrator. I just wanted to um, tell uh, Bill that the minutes. He's right. He Bill's taking minutes, correct? Yes. I am, yes. yes. So I can get you all the transcript from this meeting as well. That so, would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's a written transcript. Um, if you're unable to mute your phone, just make sure that you're in a quiet place. Otherwise, please mute your phone. And please remember to announce yourself if you're not on video so we have your name and who is speaking. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Okay, uh, is Dan there and Matt and Mark? Dan there and yes, sir. Okay, yep. Yep. We're, yep. I think I think we're all set. Is that all right with you people? That was perfect. Neg negative yeah. four, <laughs> what we were looking for. Negative four, yes. Thank you all for your time. Okay, yep. okay. Thank, you. thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Okay, uh, now the next one is going to be for the uh, an NLI for the Town of Deerfield Highway Department for uh, a new culvert in, on uh, Kelleher Drive. And we have uh, Ty and Bond representing the town, I believe. You could... Uh, just say who, who's here and. Sure. My name is Zach Chorniak. I'm a project manager with Ty and Bond for this project. And we have Katie Wilkins as well. Um, she's the environmental specialist on this job. You want to give a, a, a background of the project, description of the project, um, and go from there? Yes. Yes. If you could, uh, you know, just give us a. An idea of what's happening and uh, or what's okay. planned and uh, maybe gonna... the time period and what's going on with that too. Absolutely. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully everybody can see it. Can people see the uh, cover page of the drawings? Yes, yeah, sir. I got it. Right, I, let's see the thumbs up. That's great. Uh, again, I'm Zach Chorniak. I'm the project manager from Tie and Bond. Um, this project involves uh, the replacement of a roughly five and a half foot um, diameter slash oval corrugated metal arch culvert passing under Kelleher Drive that um, conveys the Bloody Brook under the road. The culvert's in failing condition. It's got some perforations on the top and bottom of the pipe. 
Um, the town's been, you know, patching it over the last couple of years and it's become, uh, you know, a, a large safety concerns for um, traffic going over that culvert. Uh, let me just get to the existing condition sheet here so I can show some of the specifics. We'll go right to the design drawing. Zach, can you just say the page you're on so that people sure. at home that aren't on video can follow along? Yep, good point, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna talk from sheet C102. It shows and the- uh, Zach, the uh, one, one thing. So it's Bill Mayer of PC. If anyone can't see what, I, I do believe that we all have Zoom uh, capabilities to make this larger if we can't see while we're in the meeting. Or maybe it's just you, Zach, that does. Yep. Um, is, this, is this better? Yeah, thank you so much. Sure, no problem, I was gonna ask that. Um, so North Main Street runs north to south, uh, Kelleher Drive uh, east to west. Bloody Brook um, conveys stormwater from uh, the north to the south under the road. The project is basically uh, replacing the corrugated metal arch culvert with a three-sided open bottom precast concrete culvert. Uh, with integral precast concrete head walls on either end. Um, you know, the, the intent here is to uh, meet river and stream crossing standards as best we can. Um, it's a nine and a half foot span. So, um, you know, bank full width uh, is 1.2 times, excuse me, the, the width of the culvert has to be a minimum of 1.2 times the bank full width and we're meeting that. Um, and we're just about meeting the openness ratio as well. The project does involve a little bit of, um, you know, uh, wetlands impacts. So we have some uh, wetland mitigation work and I'll let Katie explain that a little more detail in a minute here. Um, the project, it was designed under a municipal vulnerability um, planning grant. Um, and that was the design and then uh, an additional grant through that program, but an action grant was awarded to uh, proceed with the construction. So. Um, Construction is likely going to take place here uh, as long as permits uh, are in hand, um, hopefully in the next few months, uh, and be done this summer. Um, pretty pretty straightforward job. I think uh, we include a little bit of water main replacement and relocation along the south end of the culvert here. It's important to note that the existing water main is buried just below um, the invert of the stream. Uh, obviously, our new head wall there is going to impact that, so we're taking that and putting it um, up up in the roadway. And that'll be sleeved through through the culvert underneath the stream with appropriate depth of cover so that if it ever has a problem, uh, it, you know, it can be replaced without having to dig up the stream and or the culvert later on. Um, two pluses right there. So I guess, Katie, do you want to go over the wetlands impacts specifically and what we're doing for wetlands restoration as well? If there's no questions about the overall project. Sure. Um, I'll jump into mine and I guess we can continue with any of there's any overall questions. Feel free to to jump in or ask. Um, as Zach said, uh, the culvert, the existing 66 inch CMP conveys Bloody Brook. Bloody Brook is a perennial stream, so it has a 200 foot riverfront area. Um, so the entire project area is located within riverfront area. Um, so that's about uh, 4,300 square feet. Um, other impact areas are land underwater at 1,125 square feet, and that's pretty much the area within the existing culvert. Um, the proposed new culvert area and any of the area that's included in the dewatering um, section, which is coffer dammed out. Um, the whole site is also within bordering land subject to flooding. So we have about 2,400 square feet of impacts within that. Um, we are not going to be changing any of the flood carrying capacity of the site. So we're not reducing um, flood storage. If anything, we're increasing it by grading some of these slopes back. So we're, we're actually taking some land away. Um, there is some BBW impact that's located on the um, the northwest side of the culvert. Um, you can see that by flag 1A3, I believe that is, or 1A2. Um, 
there's a shaded area. Zach, if you don't mind putting your cursor in that location. Um, right in there, we have some we have some permanent wetland impact just from the installation of the culvert. Um, there's a bordering vegetated wetland that goes off to that northeast side. Um, I'm sure anybody who's driven by it's that low lying area that gets flooded over um, pretty regularly. Um, right now, there's no specific vegetation. It's kind of a, a maintained lawn area, but um, hydrology and soils kind of identified that it, that it was a wet location. So that small area that Zach was pointing at, we have about 34 square feet of uh, permanent impacts. And then we also included about 110 square feet of temporary impacts, kind of the area that's located within the erosion controls, which is kind of that boxed uh, symbology. Um, we just can't, we know that contractors are going to need to get down and in there and they're most likely going to um, impact it slightly. So we just wanted to make sure we accounted for it. So that area will be restored in situ. So we don't plan mm -hmm. on replacing or replicating for any of that. But the 34 square feet of permanent impacts, we're planning on doing replication um, along the east side of the wetland. There's a slope between the road and the wetland, and we're hoping to be able to pull that slope actually out a bit more and um, bring that down to grade. So it's the same grades. So we have the same sort of hydrology as the existing wetland to, to replicate for our, our 34 square feet of loss. So that's actually 210 square feet of additional bordering vegetated wetland that we're creating along that side. Um, that's the, the hatched uh, area that's kind of shaded off to the left-hand side between flags 1D2 and 1D5. Um, for bank impacts, we have about 200 linear feet. That includes the uh, 52 linear feet of the actual culvert, as well as um, the banks to the north and to the south, both on the north and uh, the east and west sides of the culvert. Um, we are kind of creating some new bank because the width of the culvert is increasing. So the current bank size is uh, a little bit more narrow. So we're increasing that a, a fair bit. And um, we're going to be stabilizing the banks with core logs, coconut fiber core logs. Um, those get staked into the ground and kind of stacked on top of each other. And we'll have um, plantings, stakes. So we're going to be using a uh, silky dogwood stake in that area, mostly because of similar um, similar species located to the north of the project site. Um, a lot of the times it's willow stakes used, but there weren't a, a, a ton of willows in the area other than that large uh, ornamental that's right in the middle of the wetland area. So Zach's showing a detail of kind of how, how the stakings go in and how the core logs are installed. Um, so those will be used to kind of help recreate a more natural bank instead of using riprap. We didn't feel that riprap is... Uh, necessary in this area based on the flow. Um, although there's a fair bit of water that travels through this area, it's not at a high velocity. So uh, we didn't think it was necessary to, to really armor those banks. So we're hoping that will kind of create a more natural bank as well. Um, so that's kind of the breakdown of, of what we're what we're doing around the culvert to yeah. during construction. Oh, go ahead if somebody has a question. Nope. Um, so during construction, we have uh, we're going to be dewatering the work area. So we're going to coffer dam um, both upstream and downstream of the culvert, most likely using some sort of sandbag uh, system with the, uh, and then be bypass pumping from upstream of the work area to downstream of the work area. Uh, the bypass pumping will go across the road. Um, it'll be protected from any cars driving over. Um, one other component is the fact that there is no other way in or out on this road. So we're going to have to do a phased approach um, to this installation. So we can't obviously close down the entire road to do the replacement. So um, one section will be open and the next section will be fixed and, and vice versa to allow for uh, everybody that lives on that area to, to get to their house. Um, <laughs> going on there, Zach? <laughs> uh, so the area that's within the, the work, within the cofferdams, the proposed work area, that will need to be dewatered as well. 
So we are proposing a, a dewatering basin off to the side in an upland location. I know that there was some commentary from DEP regarding where that should be located and uh, what it should look like. And we do have a detail in the plan set uh, that identifies what the dewatering basin would look like. Um, we have been in communication with the property owner at 112 North Main Street and hoping to use some of his property to um, create that sediment basin. So it's it's a fabric lined kind of square basin that's surrounded by hay bales um, that we can pump into and then the water slowly percolates out from there to the stream channel. Um, we are we're also going to have hay bales and silt fence along that lower or that southeastern uh, perimeter of the work area. So um, the dewatering basin will be located outside of that uh, hay bale silt fence line. Um, based on the, the kind of tight quarters we've got working here and based on the phasing, they may need to move the sediment basin a couple times just um, just based on where they can put equipment and where they can stockpile everything. So um, it may be a, a bit of a moving target, but once the uh, initial dewatering system process happens, um, it'll just be maintenance dewatering. So hopefully that will, um, it, it should be less than the initial kind of influx of, of dewatered water. Okay, I'll expand on that a little bit too. The, uh, yep. the drawings and the specs kind of, kind of work together. Uh, you know, the requirements for the dewatering is a performance based specifications, you know, no sediment transport downstream. Um, you know, we're going to require a submittal for the dewatering plan that we're going to review pretty strictly. We're also going to be on site monitoring this stuff uh, throughout the duration of the construction. So if they do need to choose a different location that's upwind, um, you know, it'll have to be approved through the engineer uh, prior to make sure that it's going to meet the performance criteria that we specify. Can I ask a question? Make a request? Sure. Um, my name is David Johnson, and, and I live in that house, 112 North Main Street, and no one has spoken to me about this at all. I heard you say that, that I'd, I'd already been addressed. No one has spoken to me, so I really have no information about this whatsoever. Yeah, the, the dewatering uh, specifically, it's, um, sorry, you're, you're on the south side of the project right over here, 112. Correct. Um, that's right, just pointing out for the, the commission. Um, the part of the project is going to be, you know, impacting, you know, on your property, similar to where the culvert is now. The culvert existing is partially on your property. Oh, I so, see what you're talking about. Right, right. So the, the, the way they do the work is they're going to set up a coffer dam down here and a coffer dam upstream. That's going to limit the amount of flow that comes through the site. And they'll, they'll bypass pump around back into the stream. But for the area where they're going to work in between those, you know, where the culvert's going to be placed, obviously they have to dig down below frost line. They'll probably get into some degree of groundwater. They need to pump out that groundwater to work in the dry to be able to set those footings. And all that, all that means is they're going to pump up to an area that's above the elevation of the stream so that the sediment can go through a, a uh, filter bag and trickle back into the stream with clean water. Um, in, in its simplest way and you know happy to have discussions on you know you know what what you prefer on site um, but do know that the contractor is responsible for a hundred percent of restoration of what they disturb um, anywhere on the site and on your property so you'll get loam and seed and grass back there at the end of the day okay I wasn't concerned so much about that as much as in terms of how you were going to you know shore up the bank and I didn't quite mm -hmm. understand that and I I haven't spoken to anyone about that, so I didn't. I just didn't comprehend what was going on. Yeah, and I can elaborate a little more on that. Um, you know, excavation support is again contractors' means and methods. They may have several different ways they do that. They may open up a giant hole in the road and shelf the excavation back, you know, to OSHA standards, so that it's not caving in. Or they may drive sheeting um, and do their excavation that way. But what we anticipate doing that might impact you as well. Although I think your driveway is not on Kelleher. Um, Correct. Do you have a driveway on Kelleher? No, I don't. No, it's on the other side. I guess the other homeowner does, but all the other residents going up Kelleher Drive, you know, tra traffic is was our concern. So the intent sure. here is they'll they'll uh, rip out and replace half the culvert, maintain alternating one-way traffic, 
and then switch sides and do the same thing, meaning alternating one way traffic on the on the other side. Okay. That way, emergency services, um, you know, school buses. Although we're probably we're not going to have school buses for a while, <laughs> uh, you know, traffic can get by those kinds of things. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. This is this is Louis Mission, uh, Zach or Katie. Or Zach, I guess you were saying you will be overseeing this project or having someone on site occasionally, or is that how you're going to do it? Correct. We're going to have full-time on-site uh, construction observation. Um, the duration of the active construction is it's, it's probably less than two weeks, uh, I think, from when they start to when they finish, uh, minus a little bit of delay uh, for paving at the end to allow for any settlement. Um, you know, digging and placing this culvert is going to be a fairly quick process. In fact, they're probably going to be able to do it mostly around the weather. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's hard to set up a bypass pump that can handle you know a five-year storm if that was on the horizon. So, um, yeah, their dewatering plan will um, generally handle the normal flows of the stream, but they're going to have provisions in that dewatering plan to um, you know remove those pumps and stabilize the site to let the water flow through the site. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. So you're saying that it's still, we're not, you're not a hundred percent sure on the uh, dewatering location right now. You're saying, right? I guess uh, we're, we're a hundred percent sure of what we specified in terms of performance. It has to be in an upland area. And it has to allow uh, through the filter bag, no sediment going downstream. Um, the specific location of where that's placed on the site, you know, could be in a bunch of different spots. There's there's a grassy area here to the southwest side. You know, that would work well. Um, it depends on where their machine's going to be sitting, where the crane's going to sit. Uh, you know, a little bit of how they're going to structure their site. So their dewatering plan will cover that. And again, we'll be reviewing that pretty uh, stringently. Okay, but you will have someone on site, you're saying? Correct. For inspection. Okay, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I know, like, that was one of Mark's concerns. And and uh, maybe uh, if, if Katie could, if you could just go over uh, Mark's concerns on the, uh, or his comments there on the project. You got to unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I will go over those now. So we pulled together. Um, so Mark, when he issued his file number, he had a, a few comments and questions. So the first comment he had was, um, the address for the property owner appears to be one Kelleher Drive, not three Kelleher Drive, um, which is correct. It, it is one Kelleher Drive, not three Kelleher Drive. That was a mistake on my part. Um, item number two was additional info on the dewatering should be provided to the commission. No information of the dewatering basin is provided and its location is apparently not known, nor is known how the water will get back to the stream, the commission needs to be aware that dewatering areas, unless properly monitored, will likely cause a sediment plume into the water column. The commission should review section 2.1.1.4 of the notice of intent. Um, I think we addressed kind of that commentary just in our, in our previous conversa conversation. Um, we commented back saying standard dewatering measures will be employed during construction of their replacement culvert. Excess water within the cofferdammed work area will be pumped into trash with trash pumps and discharged to an appropriate treatment system in the upland location adjacent to the work area. A typical temporary sediment trap is depicted on sheets C104 of the project drawings. This trap consists of a filter bag surrounded by straw bales. Upon completion of construction, the area disturbed for the temporary sediment trap will be restored to pre-existing or improved conditions. As previously noted, the location of the dewatering area is proposed in an upland location adjacent to the work area. Due to the proximity of the culvert to private residence, location of dewatering basins will need to be coordinated with the butters. Um, and we suggested the commission um, 
condition the submittal of the dewatering plan by the contractor prior to the start of work. So they'll need to submit that dewatering plan to us, the tie and bond, and um, we are going to suggest that they also submit that to the Conservation Commission. And um, it was our suggestion that it, it become a special condition um, if it if the commission sees fit or or wants to have that included. Right. That's that's what I was thinking. And, you know, or I was going to suggest is is have us you know notified also on that plan. And I didn't realize that you would be monitoring it also full time. So that's that's a that, that that's good too for us yeah i was unaware during the site visit we had on the 29th that we'd have a full-time construction monitor on site so um, it makes me feel better as well hey louis this is pete law just one quick comment and it, it does sound good we have the you know the inspectors on site and so forth but i think katie just said that you know, we suggest the alert the commission of the plan. Um, can we make that that they have to provide us with the dewatering plan, the, the contractor, versus a suggestion to do so? Yes, that'll be on the uh, order of conditions. This is Louis, sure. and uh, you know, we'll write it right in when, and then we'll be signing it. So that'd be one of the uh, orders of condition that they'll have Correct. to submit it prior to the start. And yeah. Thank you. Perfect. That will likely um, come to you guys through us because we're going to approve that plan. Um, and what I'll do is once we get that submittal approved, uh, you know, we'll just make sure we forward it right along to you guys. Yeah, no, that that'd be perfect. Uh, just okay. as soon you, you know, I mean, you'll be on site reviewing it anyway, so you could, uh, yeah, review it first and then uh, send it to us so we can uh, have it on record and to review also. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll let you go, Katie, to the next. Okay. One. <laughs> um, number three um, is, as Mark says, as noted in the notice of intent, stream stats show that the stream has a computed bank full width of 21 feet. The information submitted to show compliance with the stream crossing standards to the maximum extent practicable is inadequate and incomplete. Actual field measurements must be taken to confirm the average bank full width. Several upstream and downstream locations must be reviewed outside of the influence of the existing culvert. The three required reviews for alternatives are likely for are like for like maximum extent practicable and then full compliance. Clearly a 9.8 foot wide culvert is not full compliance if bank full is 21 feet. None of us provide an option for the commission to review for full compliance. That information should be provided to the commission and this review or prior to the close of the public hearing. There appears to be su sufficient time prior to the public hearing to acquire actual field data that is more in line with the requirements of the stream crossing handbook. Um, so our response to that was, we did actually do bankful width measurements um, when we first did the delineation. Um, bankful width of Bloody Brook was measured at several locations upstream and downstream of Kelleher Drive culvert. Bloody Brook is a relatively low gradient stream with a dis, uh, distinct channel and break and slope between stream and floodplain. Bankful width along Bloody, Bloody Brook was generally determined by the change from the vertical bank to the horizontal surface. Um, table 1.1, which we included in their response to comments, outlines the bankful width measures along the stream channel and are identified on figure four in attachment B, which is included on this response to comments. So, um, our bankful widths upstream and downstream, uh, we had a bankful width of 15, 5, downstream was 15, um, which was located downstream of the North Main Street culvert. Um, upstream was 5 feet, 8 feet, 10 feet, 7 feet, 4 feet, and 21 feet. Um, so we, as we continue, so with the existing crossing width of 5.5 feet, the proposed crossing exceeds the requirements of the 1.2 times bank full width. While this is less than the width calculated by USGS stream stats noted by Mr. Stinson, it is Ty and Bond's experience that the computation in stream stats using regression equations typically vary from the bank full width measured in the field. We have often found that the stream stats values are conservative compared to bank full width 
as determined based on site geomorphic features measured in the field. And I can I can expand on that a little bit too. I just I was looking at stream stats for a different project today that had the same discrepancy. When you're higher up in the watershed, obviously there's less drainage area going to the stream, and that usually translates to a, a narrower um, cross-sectional area. As you go downstream, the stream picks up more and more surface area and drainage area, and therefore more flow, which generally translates to a, a wider, uh, a wider or or deeper and faster moving stream. And here, that's really the case. The Kelleher Drive culvert is pretty high up in the watershed. Um, you know, the low-lying areas, probably a couple thousand feet upstream, is um, is really the beginning of the stream. So, you not you don't have a whole lot of drainage area coming to this culvert. Um, if you go down to uh, the south, you know, one thing we do for for these projects is we we look at the H and H, the hydrologic and hydraulic uh, capacity, and and uh, what the watershed generates. Um, when we upsize a culvert upstream, we want to make sure we're not causing a hydraulic problem downstream, you know, moving a flooding problem downstream. So we go down and look at other crossings and um, evaluate those potential impacts as well. And as you get to the railroad tracks uh, and closer to the river, um, yes, the stream does get wider down there. So uh, the measurements we took for bankful width that impact this culvert, you know, we think the average is... Um, a lot less than that uh, stream stats figure of 15 feet, I think. So um, the 1.2 times our average is uh, a little less than what our culvert span is now. So we think we meet that criteria. I hope that makes sense in uh, that explanation. Um, if there's no questions, I'll move to comment number four. Uh, to Mark said, at, um, comments to prevent failure, all constructed banks should be should have a height to width ratio of no greater than one to one and a half vertical horizontal, unless the stream is naturally incised. It should be tied into the up and downstream banks and configured to be stable during a 100 year storm event. Both upstream and downstream slopes include core log. Oh, oh, I skipped a spot. Sorry, <laughs> and configured and configured to be stable during the 100-year storm event. The bank should be designed and constructed as to not hinder riverine wildlife use of the stream bed and banks for passage. Um, so Time Bond's response is, the proposed design meets the criteria of bank slope ratio of a one to one and a half in the downstream section of bank restoration. The slopes upstream of the culvert are one to one and is where the stream is currently naturally incised. Both upstream and downstream slopes include core logs and plantings for bank stabilization and should be stable during a 100 year storm event. Any comments or questions, Zach? You good with that? Accurate. Okay. Um, comment number five During dewatering, aquatic organisms, fish, salamanders, crayfish, mussels, that may be stranded during dewatering should be preserved. Our response is the contractor will be directed to designate an individual member of the crew to monitor the dewatering area for the presence of stranded aquatic organisms and, if observed, carefully relocate them to suitable habitat either upstream or downstream of the isolated work area during dewatering activities. And again, our construction observers will be paying attention to that, that as well. Okay, I was just going to say that that you're going to have someone on site all the time to to review that for us. Okay. I I have no other comment. Anybody else? No, sir. This is Bill Mayer, PC. I just I was reading along with the information from Mark Stenson, so thank you very much. I don't have any further comment. Um, the last comment that Mark had is, in order to provide an appropriate water depth and velocities at a variety of flows and especially low flows, it's necessary to preserve or reconstruct the stream bed within the structure. It is important that a continuous thou wag, deepest portion of the channel, be maintained through the structure. When constructing the stream bed, a special attention should be paid to the sizing and arrangement of materials within the structure. Um, our response is the stream form will be evaluated and adjusted before a request for certificate of compliance is submitted. So we plan on, on 
reconfiguring the stream channel as necessary. Um, Zach's got a good the detail up there. So we're creating that salwag for that low flow area, the deepest portion of the channel, and also accounting for wildlife passage along the kind of shelved bank off to the side. Um, the, the substrate within the existing channel is, is kind of a mix of <laughs> material. There's a little bit of sand and gravel, but it's a lot of organic matter and silt kind of mixed in there that comes from the upland um, farm fields and lawns and um, the up the upgradient wetland. So um, not a ton of rock is going to be placed in here, but obviously some to uh, to create that that bank that's currently in the culvert. In terms of the design, we're, we're really concerned about two things. Uh, you know, one, trying to match uh, existing um, materials as best we can, but two, also, we don't want, uh, I guess it's three things. We don't want erosion um, in the culvert occurring, um, you know, causing any kind of ponding or, or head cutting. Um, and we don't want the water to come in the culvert and flow uh, subsurface through, you know, if you can envision a bunch of rock and stone, um, you know, the, the water could just go through the stone and not have a continuous uh, open open channel. So, um, you know, the, the comment here is, uh, we call out the material to be restore stream bed with native material removed during excavation to the extent possible um, and as approved by the engineer owner. Imported material shall match existing stream bed characteristics, including gradation uh, immediately upstream and downstream of the culvert. And then the key term here is wash fines to compact fill voids to prevent subsurface water migration. So we're going to have them, you know, wash sediment through the, that stone to make sure that it's dense uh, and, um, um, you know, fill the voids so that the water's not going to flow, um, you know, below, below the elevation of the thal web. So we have a continuous flow of water through there. That, that was it for Mark's comments and, and our responses, but. Okay, I, I have a question on the construction. On the culvert, uh, now you, it's, it's, it's gonna be two sections and it's precast footings too, is that my understanding? Yeah, it's gonna be um, more than two sections. So the culvert length is 52 feet long. Uh, usually culverts of this caliber have, you know, roughly a one foot top slab. The sides are, are between 10 inches and 12 inches thick. Um, and we have, you know, I think this is about nine feet tall here. Um, so the, the sections that come on the trucks are limited by the amount of weight the trucks can carry, obviously. So they're probably five to six foot horizontal sections that will get placed. But the construction project will take part in two phases, right? So they're yeah. gonna come in, open half the road, um, keep the other half stable for traffic, They'll prep the subgrade, uh, compact with stone and their fabric. They will put precast footings down that have these chamfers in them. And then they'll, with a crane, come in and uh, set sections of culvert. And in between the sections of culvert, uh, there's a, a bitumastic sealer, you know, to prevent water from, um, and, and the possibility of any kind of sinkholes and, and sediment migration through the culvert. That, yeah, um, that, that, that was gonna be my main, question was how you're going to seal between the uh, sections right so the the it's it's typically that and they'll have bolt hole pockets and there's these big one inch galvanized bolts that go in and they and they crimp it shut so you have a watertight seal uh that's typically what we see see done our our spec for the culvert to what we call a performance spec right so we we define the type of concrete um, the performance characteristics of the culvert, you know, what loading it needs to hold, um, you know, the air entrainment and the concrete that needs to occur, um, and then the size and shape of it. It's up to the uh, precaster to figure out how to get that done, how much rebar they have to have, and they, as part of our project, need to submit um, that design to us, and it's got to be stamped by a mass structural professional engineer as well. And we have a chance to comment on that. And one of those things is exactly what you just said. We want to make sure there's no um, uh, leaking joints, uh, you know, to prevent any kind of sediment migration going into the stream from, from the soil around it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, 
Anybody have any uh, questions here for Ty and Bond? I think it's been fairly thoroughly described. This is Tim Hilchey. This is Bill Mayer, PC. I agree with, with Tim. I feel like the uh, description presentation has been thorough. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, I'd say the same. I've been looking at the sheets here, and it, um, I don't see anything that hasn't been uh, discussed and answered. So thank you very much. Hey, is Kevin Scarborough there? You, yes, Kevin, I am. Do you have any yeah. uh, you have any comments on this, or or what? What can no, you say no. how this how the uh, schedule is going for it? You know, the well, my general my general understanding is we're we're looking at possibly being able to. Oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm mixing, um, mixing projects. Sorry, I was thinking of uh, Mill River, or Mill Village. Um, Zach is is more of con in how do I want to put this. Zach has a better handle on the abilities of the contractors at this point in time for materials coming in. So the actual starting date of this. I, I can't tell you. Okay. I mean, it's, it's the there's a couple it's things in the works as well. Uh, this is one piece of the pie, obviously, the, the order of conditions from you folks. Um, the project has been bid. We have not issued an award yet, uh, but we do have a low bidder that we're evaluating. Um, it was decided to bid the project before getting any um, permitting approvals because of uh, grant funding deadlines. Um, the MVP grant that is is uh, in the works now was originally the money needed to be spent by June 30th. Um, if we issued a notice to proceed today, you know, concrete fabrication is probably a month um, after we get submittals complete. You know, you're, you're already beyond June 30th at that point. So during this period that we're in now with COVID-19, uh, the MVP grant people, I think, are in the works. Uh, I think they verbally told us they're going to extend the um the duration of of a well, uh, when we can withdraw funds from that grant, um, which has enabled us to you know have a little less stress about um, getting the project done. So the the other piece is uh, this project required um, um, Army Corps uh, pre construction notification and and project notification form that was submitted roughly the same time we've submitted to you guys, but there's a longer turnaround on receiving their approvals. Um, they, they've told us they're going to do their best to expedite this project, recognizing it's grant funded um, for a small town, especially, um, you know, rare opportunities. So uh, we're hoping we get that approval here in the next month, but obviously construction can't start until we get that as well. Um, so we're aware of all those things. I think realistically starting construction, you know, no earlier than two months from now is probably the, the closest you'll see work occur out there. The goal is to have it done, um, you know, certainly before the end of fall time. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hey, Zach, this is Pete Law. I'm just curious, what's the Corps of Engineer uh, approval that you need? What? Uh, it's the, the project notification form and the pre, uh, pre construction notification. Okay, because of the. Okay, thank you. Yep, sure. Is there anybody in the audience got any questions or comments? No. Okay. I guess it, it looks like a good project to myself. I, you know, I, I know it's got to be done, and uh, you know, I think everything pretty much is. Uh, figured out and I feel comfortable that you're going to have uh, somebody on site all the time, full time. That was the big concern is, you know, letting a project go without, especially in an area like this, without anybody overseeing it for the uh, engineer for the town. And I know Kevin can't just stay there the whole time. Mm -hmm. So that, that part there, I, I, you know, makes me feel comfortable on the project here. Plus your comments and, uh, you know, like I say, the uh, 
condition I would I would like to see is uh, seeing the reports prior to start to that you approve for the dewatering. So anybody else got any any comments here on what they'd like to see or everybody all the members happy? Bill Mayor PC, yeah, I do believe that the, the order of conditions needs to be clear in regards to the dewatering. Yeah, it's Pete Lodd, uh, Louis. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the approach. And as you mentioned, and you know, we do want to see the dewatering uh, details when they're available. Okay, uh, Tim. Any any comments? I think that um, <clears throat> the dewatering is the major issue, and you guys have. Uh, a lot of my concerns are alleviated because the engineer is going to be on site during the project. Yeah. So that's a, a lot better than, you know, spot checks. So. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> ben Burn, I, uh, yeah, I agree with the rest of you. Okay. Uh, guess if there's no other comments out there, then uh, you know, we ready for make a motion to uh, to accept the plans and uh, sign off on the uh, NOI with the uh, condition that uh, we receive the dewatering plan prior to start for our review. Also, they want so that sounded like a motion. Louis, um, I'll but, make uh, a motion that it is. <laughs> okay. So given that motion, I would second that motion uh, that given the order conditions that we receive the details of dewatering prior to the start. And that's Bill second. Yeah. Ben All, Burn, in, aye. All in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Bill Mayor, PC, aye. Pete Law, Louis. aye. Louis Mission, aye. So I ben guess Burn, uh, we'll uh, we, we'll sign off on it with that order of conditions with the dewater and put in it. And uh, I think that'll make Kevin happy here too. <laughs> yes, we will. We can get going. <laughs> Be nice. And and, and the people and the people on Kelleher Drive also. That we don't have a collapse there. So I thank uh, Katie and Zach. And uh, I guess we're we're all set. Very good. We'll, thank you uh, all. I appreciate it. Good night. Thanks good very night. much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Katie, got a question? Yeah, I just had a quick question. <laughs> I don't know who's jumping off. Administratively, how are you guys dealing with uh, issuing the orders of conditions? Are you signing electronically and then we're providing that to us in a paper form? I I, I haven't actually had to try to uh, record an order yet during all yeah. of this nonsense. Hmm. That's a good point. Uh, here's, here's Jennifer. She'll explain it. <laughs> Hi. So we... Um, Sue, the the assistant in in their de, in that department um, has a, Adobe Adobe, and so do I, and so we'll probably do electronic signatures. If okay. if you're good with it, we can put it into that format and then send it out to you. Okay, yeah, I think that um, I think the registry is actually okay with that now, from what I understand, because people can't just sign things; um, they normally want the the wet signatures. And don't usually yeah. take copies, but I think it should be fine. We'll try that and yeah, we'll move forward with that. Okay. Okay. Um, would you, are you planning on sending it to Kevin? Or are you gonna we're we're gonna record it? So I don't know if it's better for me to pick it up somewhere or if it's, well, <laughs> I don't what know. We, what we can do is we can have all the signatures on it. Kevin um, comes into the office with his mask and you know protective and six feet away so I can even leave it on the table out in the center and he can sign it or take it or you know 
and then um, we can do the sit. We can either mail it to you or put it out in the foyer area, and you can pick it up. Okay, yeah, it might. It, it would be easier for me just to put it out in the foyer, and I can come get it. I'm just okay. up in Greenfield, so I can shoot right down. Okay, and I can let you know too. And um, you know, I can even if I can, I'm there, so I can bring it out to you. You can just call me. I'm um, extension 104, and or Sue, and um, Sue's not in the office all the time. She's working remotely. And uh, okay, you know, so we could just bring it out to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Good thank night. You. Okay, very good. good. Thank you all. Bye, Katie. All right. Good night, Kevin. Bye. Katie. All right. Good night. Is, Bye. Thank you. Are you guys? Did we're, you do your um, last approval? Your last minutes? No, we're not done oh. yet. Oh, you're no, not we're not done yet. We got a few more minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we got the uh, the review of the minutes of the March twenty sixth meeting. Has everybody had a chance to look at the? Minutes. Yes, there was one thing that I wanted us to take a look at, Louis. Um, it's the original. My recollection of the original vote to not to to sort of table the discussion about the driveway was that initially we started down one path and we started to vote on something, and then after um, the three, after Bill Mayor PC Law and I said we'd feel let, more comfortable if we didn't do it that night. You you actually changed your vote and and is that correct? I just wanted to that that was the only thing I had a question about is that particular vote. Because it was recorded as a three to two and and I think that you actually might have altered your position just because you you said, yeah, I think I'll side with the rest of the group. So what's your recollection? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I did a not really oppose, but I, you know, was going with uh, like Mark was, you know, had mentioned before that that uh, it, it shouldn't be a problem with it. But uh, I think I ended up, even though I kind of opposed it, I just kind of say let's 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 continue it. So I don't know if I really voted to okay. accept, but I did vote that. We should continue it. So I don't know how that. I yeah, wasn't I, really I, sure. Yeah, that's why I raised it to. Um, yeah. I clearly recollect. You know, I, I I did see that, but I says, well, we had the uh, enough for a quorum to uh, continue it. So yeah. I. That's you know, maybe it. maybe in the wording a little bit, but. Yeah. I'm know. fine with it. Otherwise, um, unless somebody else had questions or comments no I, I i did notice it but i'm not sure how i really voted just to, <laughs> I, I think i, I think i was kind of like okay let's just continue the you know yeah, until next that's, that's my recollection was that you you decided like yeah continuation makes sense yeah i just wanted to move it along i guess i i, I guess so so either way <laughs> Uh, other than that, anybody else got comments on the uh, minutes? Bill Mayor, PC Tim, thank you for bringing that up. I'm I'm not sure that changing the minutes is necessary because. No, I, I I agree. May I make a motion to accept the minutes as written? Um, I second. That's Tim second it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, all in uh, favor. Aye. Louis, Louis Mission. Ben Byrne, aye. Bill Mayer, PC, aye. Kim Hilchey, aye. Pete Law, aye. Okay, so we accepted the minutes. Uh, no mail that, of course, I haven't picked anything up, and so there's a uh, no mail to review. Uh, I believe Sue emailed 
a plan on uh, water main for uh, old, uh, coming out of Old Deerfield on five and ten. There with the uh, agenda and minutes today, or I don't know anybody happen to see that. Uh, this is Pete Law. I saw it and I didn't really study it or quite understand what it was about, but my apologies. I'll take a closer look. No. Okay. What it is, is they're, they're planning on replacing the water main and it's something that's going to come before us. And I think she just threw it in there. And I talked to the engineer that they're, uh, they're planning on doing a water main from the north entrance of uh, Old Deerfield, replacing the water main from roughly that section all the way up to Woolman Hill. And it's going to be off the edge of road. So that, that that's basically what it is. And he's going to be, come before us with more info. But just thought I'd give you a heads up on mm -hmm. that project there. So and, again, it's Pete Lott, that so that goes right up five and ten, then right next yes, to the road. Yeah, north, right in the majority yep. of it is on the right hand side, headed north. So it's off the road. Okay. And and then it yeah. does cross over, and there'll be uh, direct boring pipe underneath five and ten, up by the antique place. So it, it shouldn't be any uh, wetland issues. I mean, other than they are within the boundaries, but there should be no disturbances. But that's something, that's something down the road, the next meeting or two. They're mm -hmm. not sure exactly how they're going to go about it right now. They got to get permits with the state too. So, and that's uh, got a couple emails on. Uh, uh, Dumont building there with the grass growing. They want a certificate of uh, compliance on that grass area there on the project over by the DPW garage. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll be coming up next, next meeting. Uh, Tony uh, Wysecki said that the grass was growing, so he feels it's, it's, it's starting to take hold and something that we could sign off on but we'll do a site visit for that on the next meeting and then there's a just came today a notice of intent i believe it's a notice of intent but we'll get more information to you it's uh that yankee uh yankee candle uh research center there on elm street right in the back they want to Fix the parking lot a little bit, I guess. And of course, there's wetlands right there. So that, that'll that be probably the next, and we'll have a site visit for that. So, other than that, I guess, uh, unless anybody else got any comments or, or questions on anything? I mean, no, other than setting the next meeting date. Yeah, that's that's the thing. What do you? I mean, we we gotta see. And this one was extended a few times. You know, we we got May twenty eighth at the end, or you want to go into June fourth, something like that. Whichever works might work good for anybody. Do you think you're going to have the information for those things by the twenty eighth? Well, I, I know uh, Mark just received the, uh, the uh, I think it's the NLI on uh, the Yankee Candle parking area there at the research center. So he 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 hasn't given a number or really uh, reviewed it yet, as far as I know. I, I didn't get a chance really to look at any of the, the info either. Mm -hmm. So e either date, if you, you know, you guys don't mind the 28th, we can try to get back on, you know, staying in the month, you know, at the end of the month, like, like we have been doing. Uh, I'm flexible. We can do pretty much whatever uh, works best for everybody. 
Yeah, so, I'm open. Um, go ahead, Pete. Yeah, no, I'm just open whatever date. Okay, well, why don't we try the 28th? See how that, you know, we'll go with that. May 28th. And uh, if we need to uh, move it a, a week or so, we could do that too. But okay. I'll keep I'll keep you updated. Yep. And I think we can probably adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. I'll second it. Louis seconds it. So Tim made the motion. Louis seconded. Yes. Uh, Louis Mission, yes. Tim Hilchey, yes. <laughs> yes. Bill Mayor PC, I. yes. Pete Law, yes. Okay. Well, I guess we're all set.